But before speaking specifically about the budget, I want to uh, refer briefly to the people of River Heights who elected me. I want to thank them for their confidence in me and to let them know that when I speak in the Manitoba Legislature, as I do today, I speak on their behalf. And I will continue to voice the needs and the priorities of people in River Heights as we move towards uh, this future and the, in the 146th year of our province. There is a need today for good fiscal management. There is a need today for wise spending and investing. There is a need today to look at where we can, as a province, save dollars uh, as we move forward to create a better environment, a society which can address the needs of and provide help to those who are least fortunate and do this in a way that we can afford. To do this, we need to be sure that every dollar is wisely spent or invested, uh, every dollar collected from taxpayers, uh, every dollar uh, borrowed elsewhere, although that should only be done when we absolutely truly need it. We want to make sure that every dollar is wisely and well spent. And we also need to consider and ensure that all opportunities where we can save on unnecessary expenditures uh, of public dollars, uh, where they're not being effective, or producing results uh, are evaluated uh, and uh, changed and improved. Uh, in this process, we need to ask not just whether the approach to financial management is optimum, but we also need to ask whether the budget is adequately addressing the social needs of our society. Uh, for example, the crisis in how today's NDP approaches adequate and appropriate supports for children and families how today's NDP addresses the overall social well-being of people in our province. Social well-being, which it must be said, as the Broadbent Institute has said, uh, is low compared to other provinces. But social well-being must also be balanced in a budget by addressing our economic and environmental well-being also. And as I will discuss, notwithstanding the rhetoric of the government benches, both our economic and our environmental well-being need attention for both could be in better shape than they are today under today's NDP. Let us ask the question, does this budget have wise spending, saving, and financial management? Let us look at the budget, which was delivered April the 30th, and see if it meets the test of wise spending. Let's look at the question of whether it balances spending and saving. The budget speech is a good test of this balance. In the speech, there were 137 references to items which involved spending more, and one of those references, it should be said, was to spending on hundreds of items. Of these items, 12 were tax expenditures, and the remaining many, many items were direct expenditures. At the same time, there were only six references to actions which may save on provincial government spending. This relationship of 137 to 6 is clearly far out of balance tilted way over toward the expenditure side and far, far away from the savings side. One result of the unbalanced approach being taken by today's NDP is that the deficit is going up again. Last year's budget forecast a deficit of $324 million in core government expenditures. This year's budget forecasts a deficit of $421 million. Since last year's budget spent much more than planned, indeed, some $207 million more than budgeted. And since it's a pattern of many years for today's NDP to spend more than budgeted, we can expect today's NDP to overspend this year's budget as well, and that the deficit will likely be higher than the $421 million projected. <clears throat> a rising deficit is not a good sign, especially when today's NDP are claiming that they're doing, we are doing well uh, economically. The rising deficit is also a problem when it occurs at a time that NDP today claim that they're making progress on reducing that very same deficit which is rising. They're obviously uh, out of kilter. Let us now review where we are with our provincial deficit and our provincial debt. The end of this year will mark the seventh year in a row of deficit financing. Deficit financing began in 2009-2010 with a deficit of $185 million. 
This was coincidentally the year the MLA for St. Boniface became Premier. Deficit financing has continued since then. Cumulatively, when the budgeted deficit for this fiscal year is included, the deficits under this Premier will add up to $3.3 billion. At the same time as we've had large deficits, our debt has also been going up. Indeed, our net debt has gone up even faster, and by the end of this fiscal year, it will have risen by $9 billion during the same period. One of the substantial reasons that the debt has been going up much faster than the cumulative amount of the deficits is that today's NDP government is also borrowing extensively to pay for infrastructure spending. What's happening is that today's NDP are not spending the full PST increase revenues on infrastructure as they promised, starting with breaking that promise, of course, in 2013. They are, in fact, borrowing much of the money to pay for the infrastructure spending and using the PST money on other items. Thus, as well as dramatically increasing our debt, today's NDP breaking the promise that they spend all the new PST money on core infrastructure. And it is because the NDP are such, doing such a poor job of being accountable that Ranibal Kerry and the Manitoba Liberals have produced a platform which would provide much better and more transparent approach to supporting municipal infrastructure. One of the substantial reasons that today's NDP are in trouble with high deficits and debts is that they continue a pattern of very poor fiscal management. At the base of these serious problems is the fact that each year they've been unable to keep their spending with their, within their expenditure budget. Each year they bring in a budget of what they will spend, and each year today's NDP spend more than they budget for. In the last fiscal year, today's NDP spent more than $200 million more than budgeted. They are, in short, very poor financial managers. Uh, next, I would like to move on to talk about the question of whether this budget has a wise approach to social issues. And I want to first talk about child and family services. Let's see if this budget addresses the critical social issue of today. I will, in this context, look at child and family services, which almost above all other issues has been a center of attention and concern in Manitoba over the last several years. We have had a lengthy Phoenix Sinclair inquiry and many recommendations. We've seen the tragic deaths of Tina Fontaine and the recent violence against another 15-year-old girl who was also in care and in a hotel. It is now widely recognized that we far too many children who've been apprehended and are in the care of the government and its CFS system. At the latest count, the number of children in care is now well above 10,000 and moving close to 11,000. From international comparisons, we know that this number should be much lower than this, perhaps as low as one-tenth of this number to put us closer to the per capita numbers of children in care in countries like Australia, New Zealand, Sweden, the United Kingdom, and the United States. The consequences of taking so many children into care are not just the abuse these children may have been exposed to, but must include as well the thousands and thousands of broken families, the trauma of children being taken from their parents, the fracturing of social networks, the loss of language and culture, the loss of the benefit of a child being nurtured and breastfed by its mothers when a child is taken at birth and much more. The harm to society includes the higher rates of juvenile delinquency and crime, which occurs when children have traumatic childhoods, and the loss of the potential of these children to contribute to our society. While this is happening, the piles and piles of extensive reports on child and family services done over the last 30 years are sitting hardly used and gathering dust in front of the minister's door. If there were a lower mark than a fail, this government would receive it for their approach to children and families. If there not being a lower mark, we'll have to settle for a fail in this area. I want now to consider the broad consideration of social well-being. And in the fall of 2013, Jennifer Mason completed a benchmark study for the Broadbend Institute on the social well-being of people in provinces across Canada. Manitoba was exposed as having the lowest social well-being of all the provinces. What is particularly relevant for today's discussion is that the report looked at various indices of social well-being. 
and those where Manitoba were, was low, and where a strategy to address these poor performances could have and should have been part of the strategy outlined in the budget. I will look at several of the indices where the poor performance should have been addressed. Let me start with student achievement. As has been noted, scores of Manitoba students on the program for international student assessment have been low in reading, in math, in science, and in problem solving, and they've been falling. And while the budget doesn't, does mention efforts in the area of mathematics and some new science labs, it failed to address how our low scores in reading and in problem solving are going to be improved, and there is clearly need for some skepticism about fully addressing the need for science and math, given the past performance of this government. Next, infant mortality. Although Manitoba has performed second worst in Canada, this wasn't even mentioned in the budget and no strategy to improve our performance was provided. Incarceration. Manitoba has the highest rate of incarceration in Canada. This perhaps is not surprising since we've learned recently that children are care, in care are being incarcerated, even when there are no charges pending against them. This issue wasn't mentioned in the budget and no strategy to address it was presented. Teenage pregnancies. Manitoba has the second highest rate of teenage pregnancy in Canada. This again wasn't mentioned in the budget and there was no strategy ad provided to address it. Mental health. Manitoba fared the worst in Canada on mental health. This was mentioned in the budget speech, although briefly, which is good. But the problem we have is that the current NDP government has talked about addressing mental health issues for many years. And so far, the outcomes have not improved. And so there's justifiable skepticism of the NDP's ability to produce results given their poor performance in so many areas. Uh, indeed, the need crisis uh, in mental health has one of the reasons why it has been a focus of the efforts of Manitoba Liberals and Rana Bokeri at, for example, uh, committing to uh, fund psychologists uh, much better under Medicare to improve access to psychological services for people in Manitoba. Obesity. Manitoba was in the middle of the provinces in terms of obesity. From my point of view, even more relevant than obesity is the rate of diabetes, which is a disease which needs attention and which is related to obesity. The prevalence of diabetes in Manitoba is very high, and it's gone up dramatically uh, since this government was first elected in 1999. In the recent by-election in the PA, we were in some of the most severely affected communities in the whole province. Diabetes desperately needs attention and prevention and yet it wasn't even mentioned in the budget. Today's NDP clearly have no effective strategy to address this. So when it comes to addressing social well-being, this budget falls for far short of where it should have been. This is sad for Manitoba. It's a sad testament to the lack of direction in Manitoba under today's NDP. And even in areas which were mentioned, like childcare, we have extraordinarily long waiting lists at the moment uh, and, and the NDP, as is typical, are adding a little bit of help, but they're not solving uh, the problem of very long waiting lists and many people waiting, uh, and this being uh, a major concern in Manitoba at the moment. I'll now move to talk about economic well-being. Uh, first of all, in addressing the economic well-being of Manitobans, it's important to look a little more at the statistics presented by the Minister of Finance in his budget. Let me start with the reference which the Minister of Finance and the Premier has made to 20,000 more jobs in March of this year compared to March of last year. First, in looking at the statistic, it's pretty important to know that following the introduction of the PST increase in July of 2013, there was a very significant fall in employment in Manitoba. Employment fell from a high of 642,000 people employed in Manitoba in June of 2013 down to 613,000 in March of 2014. Uh, that's a fall of almost uh, 30,000 people employed. 
The number of people employed in March is a recovery from the very low level uh, after the PST increase. Indeed, however, it is notable that the number of people employed in March, 633,000 Manitobans, remains 9,000 below the employment numbers of June 2013. And so if we look carefully at what has happened, we actually have had a loss of 9,000 jobs uh, in this province uh, over the last uh, two years. Uh, and, and when you talk about the short-run gain of 20,000 jobs, uh, it still leaves us 9,000 jobs uh, behind. So uh, what sounds, in the Premier's words, uh, to be good, in fact, is much less impressive uh, when you consider uh, the fall uh, since uh, 2013 in June. And the fact that we are, as of March, still below the number of people employed in June of 2013, uh, indeed, uh, is a considerable and an ongoing problem. Let us look also at the approach being taken in the budget to economic growth. The budget focuses on investment in infrastructure, but it has little mention of investment in research and development, certainly not a reasoned effective plan, and when it comes to improving trade, the coherent approach, which might have been expected, is totally lacking. Further, a sensible approach, for example, reducing and eliminating the payroll tax to enable our businesses and industries to be more competitive, is also lacking. That, of course, is an approach which uh, the Manitoba Liberals and Ranibal Carey uh, have uh, have advocated uh, and would uh, introduce. The approach in one area, talking about infrastructure, but without adequate attention in other areas, is like sitting on a stool with one leg. It may be possible for a short while, but over a long period, it's much less stable than sitting on a four-legged stool. The government gets overall poor marks for its economic stewardship and economic goal and progress. Environmental stewardship. There are several areas of environmental stewardship that warrant attention. Uh, I will discuss four, including the situation of Lake Winnipeg, the recovery of orphan mine sites, the management of wildlife populations like moose, and a surface water management strategy. Uh, all uh, are important, and the latter particularly important for good stewardship of the land. Lake Winnipeg. Phosphorus levels and algal blooms on Lake Winnipeg are an ongoing concern. The full treatment of the city of Winnipeg sewage to remove phosphorus is still not complete, and now it's not likely to be completed for at least several more years. It's important to know that we're now nine years after the report of the Lake Winnipeg Stewardship Committee, and this was important and was stressed as being vital to be done as soon as possible but nine years later, uh, we still have the biggest North End plant uh, to address. Uh, we are still waiting. Orphan mine sites. Well, there has been some small progress made to reclaim tailing sites at orphan mine sites at Sheridan and Lynn Lake. Uh, these efforts to date are still small, and there remains much to do. The action has been slow, and the need for continued attention wasn't even mentioned in the budget speech. Wildlife populations. Moose, for example. It's well known that in Manitoba, moose are not doing well under the management of the NDP. And this, indeed, has been known for quite some time. It's been pointed out that the problems with the moose population in various areas of our province could have been addressed early if the NDP had been providing adequate monitoring and caught the problem early enough. But they waited uh, too long, and even today, Adequate surveys are not being done, and concerns were raised repeatedly by people in the PA constituency during the by-election recently. The surface water management strategy. An effective surface water management strategy is essential to good government stewardship, to flood and drought protection, to decreasing the phosphorus pollution of our lakes. We've waited for 14 and a half years, and it looks like we'll continue waiting. 
It was mention of a drought strategy, but little evidence it will be given the priority it needs in the comprehensive approach that would provide uh, and be needed in an overall water management strategy. Overall, then, when it comes to the environment, what was in the budget was simply not good enough. It needs to be mentioned at this point uh, that we still have many people who were evacuated in Little Saskatchewan uh, four years ago, and they are still waiting. They don't yet know even when they might be able to go back to their communities uh, because of the many delays and prevarications uh, of this government. Let me talk for a moment about some of the issues that came up in the by-election in the PAW, issues which are outstanding, uh, housing in many communities, uh, problems with the assessments in the PAW and the RM of Kelsey, which are not being addressed and haven't been for many, many years, problems with infrastructure, uh, problems with the road from Saskatchewan into the PAW, not been addressed for many years, uh, other roads uh, slight uh, to uh, Cross Lake and to Norway House uh, need uh, attention as well. Child and Family Services, including Jordan's principal, which uh, we are still waiting uh, for full implementation of, uh, are outstanding. And of course, Jordan Anderson came from Norway House, so that's particularly significant for that area. Uh, areas of health, which are not receiving the, the attention they should. Some of the highest rates of diabetes. Uh, in the province, or indeed in communities in the PAW constituencies. High rates of suicides. In fact, there was a suicide during the by-election of the PAW. Uh, I went to the funeral. It was a very sad affair. For the future, uh, considerations came up about the sharing of resource revenue, about uh, working together and stewardship of the environment. There is clearly much to do, uh, and which has not been uh, paid as much attention as it should have been. Uh, let me uh, mention a moment our uh, candidate, uh, Inez Mr. Sil Sprints, who uh, was uh, very experienced, has a uh, born in, in Thompson and uh, grew up in Thompson and Nelson House. And, uh, worked for many years in the, in the North as a social worker and then in healthcare. Uh, a lot of experience as health director for MKO and helping with the uh, flu epidemic, the H1N1 flu epidemic, when it occurred. And she talked in the by-election of having a sense of responsibility, uh, of wanting to uh, make a, a difference. She has says, uh, I've seen how stalling happens. I've seen denial of service, and I could never make sense of it. Uh, it is happening, and it's happening under this NDP government. Uh, she went on to say, and I quote, I think it's very unfortunate that some of the issues that I was looking at as a young person in the late 80s and early 90s are still apparent. I find that unacceptable. We are not moving fast enough. We are seeing increases in the rate of disease. We're seeing higher rates of suicide with our young people. We're seeing inadequate response for our elders having to make them travel long distances on bad roads to receive care. We're seeing a movement of people out of the north into areas where there are more opportunities. She goes on, having worked in the public sector for over 20 years now, I find that things are getting worse. I find that the conditions are not improving. We have seen some small steps of progress, some small indicators of progress, but overall we're actually seeing more sickness. We're seeing more sadness. We're seeing more despair. And wherever we go in the future, we have to at least start seeing indicators of health and balance and wellness. Uh, she continues, and she says, talk is over. We need action. That's what our communities keep saying. She says, I'm tired of looking at numbers. I'm tired of talking about numbers. We are not numbers. We are people, and we have a right to receive the care and the services that we're asking for. It's a time to give people hope. These are things that Inez was talking about in the by-election, and I bring them forward to illustrate the fact uh, that under today's NDP, the attention that has been paid to the PAW constituency in the last number of years has not been adequate. Uh, there needs to be more done. There needs to be more attention. Uh, there needs uh, to be better uh, action uh, rather than just words. Uh, let me talk just for a minute about uh, items in, in River Heights. 
their concerns uh, recently uh, about uh, cars having their windows smashed. We will have uh, a 13th on this. Uh, there are concerns about access to childcare spaces. We will have a forum on this on May the 31st. Uh, we are looking uh, to the future in terms of uh, recreational facilities and library facilities. Uh, there is much that needs to be done, uh, as well as caring uh, for people throughout the province. And, and people in River Heights uh, are caring people, and they are concerned with what is happening in the whole province, uh, not just what is happening in River Heights. Let me conclude. There can be little doubt that this was one of the least well-developed budgets ever presented in this legislature. As the pundit Dan Lett commented, and I quote, it looks like a budget written by people who didn't have a lot of time for focus on writing a budget, end of quote. As I will say today, the budget was not only poorly written, it was also one of the most unbalanced budgets in the history of our province, and that is why I will be voting against this budget. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci, miigwech.